from the start of change till a year after the last period is called the perimenopause. Not average, it's about three years, maybe four years. This is a time of hormone chaos. I classically get a patient comes to see me and says, made this appointment three months ago. Oh my God, I couldn't sleep. I hadn't had a period for months. I was so anxious. And for the last two months, I've had regular periods and I feel fine. I'm not even sure why I'm here, but then I thought I should come. And that's classic. So you can have weeks to months of really low estrogen and horrible symptoms, hot flushes, night sweats, irritability, anxiety, and then boom, periods come back, your ovaries start working again, and everything feels normal. Welcome to The Proof Podcast, a space for science-based conversation exploring the health and longevity benefits that come with mastering nutrition, physical exercise, mindfulness, recovery, sleep, and alignment facts, nuance, and trustworthy recommendations, minus the hyperbole. Hi friends, welcome to The Proof. I hope you're doing well. I'm your host, Simon Hill. I'm a qualified physiotherapist and nutritionist with an undergraduate physiotherapy degree and a master's in nutrition science. Today I sit down with one of the top authorities on women's health, sex hormones, and menopause, Professor Susan Davis. Susan is a clinical endocrinologist, a professor at Monash University, where she is currently running several double-blind, placebo-controlled clinical trials looking at testosterone therapy and women's health outcomes, and is a key member of the International Menopause Best Practice Guidelines. There's certainly great confusion surrounding menopause, sex hormones, HRT, etc. And in this conversation, we hit it head on. What is menopause? What symptoms women can experience? What are the physiological changes that underpin menopause? Chronic conditions like osteoporosis that changes in hormones can affect. What hormone therapy can help with? Is hormone therapy for everyone? What are the risks associated with hormone therapy? Synthetic versus compounded or bioidentical hormones? What non-hormone therapy interventions are available? Why Susan is interested in testosterone therapy for women? and much more. We spoke for almost two and a half hours. And while we covered most of the things that I wanted to, I would also encourage you to go back to the episode I did last year with Dr. Gemma Newman if you're wanting more information, especially on lifestyle changes. This was definitely a conversation where I had to personally jump out of my comfort zone. I tried to ask the questions that perhaps people are too embarrassed to ask their doctor. I hope I did what is a tremendously important topic, justice. And with that, please enjoy. This is Professor Susan Davis. Susan. Yes. Your bio is off the charts. The the academic, the, the clinical background that you have. How would you go about summarizing that? If you met someone at dinner and they said, what what is it that you do professionally? What are you interested in? What are you trying to achieve? So I'm by training an endocrinologist, which means I'm a hormone specialist. And I ended up just focusing on hormones in women. And what I'm trying to achieve is understanding how hormones act, what happens when they change, so get high or low, and when is it appropriate and how to treat women for changes in their hormones. And your heavily involved now, I believe, in kind of creating guidelines? So I led the International Guidelines for Testosterone in Women, and over many years I've been very involved in guidelines of managing menopause, hormone replacement therapy, and hormone replacement therapy in various conditions like um, in young women who stop menstruating, for example. So I'm, I'm looking forward to digging into testosterone because I think that's, I mean, it's a hormone that many consider the male sex hormone, right? I'm sure you hear that all the time. So I think there's there's probably a whole bunch of new learnings that we can cover there for people. Um, the Australian Open's on at the moment, and I keep seeing this AO everywhere. <laughs> and after your name, AO are, are the two letters that follow your name. Uh, I actually was ignorant to what an AO was, um, Can you enlighten us? It's a tremendous honor. It's part of the um, 
acknowledgements of the whole process of Officer of Order of Australia um, and their various levels, and it's one of the very high levels. And it's a peer and community honour for my work in medicine as a doctor and educator and researcher. The flow that I thought we could cover today on menopause to better understand it is starting with, and I think I stole this from one of your lectures, actually, starting with the physiology and then we can go through um, and, and sort of better understand what are the available interventions, where do the guidelines currently sit, and we can speak about uh, pharmaceutical interventions, lifestyle interventions, and just help people understand you know, what is evidence-based and, and what is perhaps misinformation. Um, I know I sit down with a lot of different academics covering a lot of different areas of science and something that often pops up is the amount of misinformation. When it comes to this topic, menopause, how are we doing? When you're reading the newspapers or you're hearing about things on social media from um, your colleagues or from perhaps friends at dinner, are we doing a good job of understanding menopause and communicating that to the public? We're doing a terrible job. And our research of Australian community certainly shows that there's a good understanding that menopause means loss of fertility and some women get hot flushes and some women get mood changes and that's where it stops. Where the real misinformation comes is about, particularly about management and particularly about understanding greater detail about what happens. And we know that the healthcare providers are very confused. So it's really an aspect that affects every single woman, but everybody seems to be running around confused. Are you the type of person, if you're at dinner and you, you hear someone say something that clearly you know is not fact uh, about hormones or uh, about menopause, are you the type of person that kind of tries to set the records straight or do you, do you stay quiet? I think it depends on the context. Um, I think sometimes you can create more trauma in a social situation by trying to correct a misunderstanding. And I think you, there are times and places for things. And I think sometimes I let stuff slide and sometimes I try and gently redirect the understanding. What are the, the most damaging kind of pieces of misinformation or myths about perimenopause or, or menopause, sex hormones, um, interventions, just at a high level here. I know that we'll probably, yep. as we get through the physiology and interventions, we'll probably delve into them and, and be able to clear them up. But what would you say, well, these are like the big myths that you would really like us to, to cover in this conversation? There are two sides of the coin. What we're seeing now is that there are the women who have got the belief that everybody should be on hormones and hormones fix everything. And hormones do fix hot flushes, some sleep disturbance, vaginal dryness, we know that. But there's a big myth about all depression is at this age, at the, at the change is menopausal. And there are a lot of women who actually have depression that needs to be treated as depression. There's real confusion about cognitive function and menopause. Um, and then there's the other side of the coin of the myths of women who are suffering terribly and are absolutely terrified to take hormone therapy because they think they're gonna get breast cancer. And then added to that, the mythology around testosterone is quite extraordinary. Again, as you said, some people thinking it's a male hormone and no one should, woman should take it. And other people thinking it's a cure-all for everything. Yeah, I was, I mean, I was interested to read about the critical role of testosterone in, in libido for women. And um, I'm hoping that we can kind of dive into that as we go through hormone uh, replacement therapy. What is menopause? Let's define a few terms here. Maybe that will make sense. Like perimenopause, menopause, premenopause. What do they, these terms mean? And what's the kind of timeline? If you were to sort of explain to a woman, these are the, the phases that you'll go through where things, hormones are changing in your body. So formally, the menopause 
is the last menstrual period a woman experiences as a result of her ovaries no longer producing eggs. Now, obviously that works if someone's having regular periods before their menopause, but if you've had a hysterectomy or you've had a, got a particular kind of IUD and endometrial lining removed, that's not gonna to apply to you. But that is the definition of that menopause. And a woman is considered to have completed menopause, you know, gone through menopause if she has not had a menstrual bleed for 12 months. That's the traditional belief. Now, obviously, we can't use that in a woman who had a hysterectomy. Say you have a hysterectomy, a woman has a hysterectomy at 45, but her ovaries are still working. She hasn't gone through menopause. So a more perhaps modern definition is the ovaries run out of eggs, don't can't produce an egg to release into the uterus to be ovulated. That's the menopause. So can you clarify that with regards to a hysterectomy? Some women will have a hysterectomy and their ovaries will still be producing eggs. In other scenarios, that's not the case. So if a woman has a hysterectomy before she's gone through menopause and her ovaries are not touched by the surgeon, the hysterectomy is not causing her menopause. The hysterectomy is simply removal of her uterus or her womb. Got you. And the ovaries can continue to work for some time afterwards, depending on the age of the woman. Mm -hmm. If a woman has gone through menopause, and let's say at 50, and at 55, she has a hysterectomy, she's already stopped her periods anyway. Okay, so we might come back to that because I believe the, the possible hormone replacement therapies may be different for a woman who doesn't have a uterus versus Correct. those who do. Um, just on that, you know, what would be the indication or reason for why someone would have a hysterectomy, hysterectomy and the ovaries are removed versus are not? So some women will have a hysterectomy with their ovaries removed. And when the ovaries are removed before a woman's entered her natural menopause, we call that surgical menopause. Um, there are reasons for that if women have extensive endometriosis, for example, or if they're found to have changes in their ovaries like lots of cysts and they've got heavy periods so there are multiple indications and of course sometimes it's due to malignancy due to a cancer of the uterus sometimes a woman will have her ovaries removed if she's been diagnosed with breast cancer and it's part of the management so there are lots of different reasons and in a in a sort of normal context a woman hasn't had a hysterectomy what's the what's the average age for menopause again the average age for menopause in australia up until recent years because we are having a demographic shift mm -hmm. is 51.5 years 51. And, and that's a bit high compared to most countries but in most if you go across the world the age range for menopause is between 47 and 51 so when you think about it we're only talking about a three-year difference so around that age is the average age of menopause. So when you say we're having a demographic shift, what is it that would be changing this and affecting the number of years where I guess someone is, is able to re reproduce and when that window closes? Well, for example, in India, the average age of menopause is 47 years. And we currently have a large Im Indian immigration to Australia. So we tend to quote the sort of white Australian figures as opposed to a broader demographic figure. So whether people who immigrate from other countries with a different age of menopause, that they will start to conform to our Australian age because of the, the environment, diet, activity, etc., or whether they will retain their own um, country of origin age right. of menopause we don't know yet so is there a, a, a potential you know mix uh, or role for genetics there as well there's a role for genetics but often it's uh, these things are environmentally dictated okay. based on nutrition mm. etc what about like use of of hormones in pre-menopause so using birth control for example would that would that affect that that window at all there's been no evidence to date that use of the oral contraceptive pill or any other form of con contraceptions meaningfully changes a woman's age at menopause. Okay. And so a woman sort of uh, enters perimenopause. And what, what's the typical age for that again? So 
with the average age of menopause being, let's stick with 51, not 51.5, the menopause transition usually commences about two years earlier, but maybe a bit earlier. In, so it's always an average. So if I say two years earlier, some women might be three or four years earlier and some women might have a very short menopause transition. We're talking averages. And for a woman who's having regular menstrual cycles, the first um, change a woman will notice is periods, menstrual bleeds become either heavier or lighter or less regular. Might be three weeks apart, then six weeks apart, then three months of regular periods, then two months of no periods. So the change in the frequency of menstruation combined with the degree of bleeding. Mm -hmm. And is that reason to go and see a physician so like through this this course where there are changes happening uh, when or should uh, a woman go and, and and see a doctor to say hey this is my body is speaking to me i'm noticing this uh you know am i going through am i am i in perimenopause and when's the time to start having that conversation to i guess de develop um uh, well, not develop the relationship, but to to have the dialogue open such that that woman is aware of the lifestyle interventions that are available and the, the pharmaceutical interventions that may be available to help her through that process. Well, I think for some women, see, so we can take, say, an example of a woman who is getting irregular cycles. They're in a very stable personal circumstances, they're not getting any hot flashes, their sleep's fine, they're not worried about their contraception, their partner's had a vasectomy or they're not sexually active or whatever. I think it's more acknowledging that this is they're starting to experience a change and I don't see any urgency for that particular person to see a doctor. But if a woman starts having very heavy bleeding or starts to experience symptoms or starts to, they can't predict their contraceptive needs so they were just looking at their cycle for their contraception they don't know when they're ovulating or not um, they're not sleeping they're starting to feel anxious is a sign of menopause so symptoms and bleeding that is disturbing to the person like heavier they should see a doctor and say this is i'm getting these changes and they're bothering me but with absolutely no bother i don't think there's a need to be rushing off and seeing someone because the doctor's going to say well are you concerned there is nothing to be concerned about at this time mm -hmm. and excuse my my ignorance here i'm sure i'm going to ask many silly questions throughout this but that's my job i'm going to try and ask the questions that maybe people are too scared to ask yeah. their physician but when we talk about menopause and the symptoms that, that come with menopause or can, and, and I appreciate they're going to vary from woman to woman, um, they'll, they'll each have their own experience, but most of the symptoms in the perimenopause phase, and because often I hear the, you know, I'm going through menopause, is that speaking to the perimenopause phase? Is menopause something by definition you go through or it's something you reach and then you're sort of in menopause yep. for the rest of your life? Yep. And when are the symptoms? So if a woman's thinking, gosh, am I gonna have these symptoms for the rest of my life? Or is it a, a sort of window where you experience the symptoms, you get to the other side, but then I'm sure as we'll discuss later, there are some some other changes that could affect chronic disease risk, long-term risk of, of things. Can you kind of shed some light on that? Okay, so let's. I'm going to put this in the context of a woman who's having regular menstrual cycles. There might be 30 days, okay? Not 28, 30. Every 30 days, she can pretty, pretty well predict her period. When her bleeding becomes either lighter or heavier, so scanty or very heavy bleed, and she notices her period's no longer 30 days, they're going two weeks, then six weeks, whatever. She has entered the menopause transition. Mm -hmm. And that continues until the day of her very last menstrual bleed. And at that point, she has hit menopause. But she doesn't know that until a year later. Mm -hmm. And she looks back and says, I haven't had a period for a year. That day, when I wrote in my diary, 
on the 25th of January 2023 was my last menstrual period. That was my menopause. This is, t this is like we're making our little textbook woman. And that is the end of her menopause transition. Mm -hmm. Her perimenopause is defined as starting at the time of her menopause transition when the periods become irregular until a year after her last bleed. Mm -hmm. So from the start of change till a year after the last period is called the perimenopause. Not average, it's about three years, maybe four years. And so when we talk about the menopause, that's actually a moment in time. And from that moment, a woman is post-menopause. Mm -hmm. gotcha. And peri is around the time of change. Got you. A moment in time, menopause. So with the symptoms, hot flushes, and I might get you to define that. I hear hot flushes, I hear hot flashes. Not sure which is the right way of saying it, but um, those symptoms, are they uh, mostly experienced during the perimenopausal phase when there are, is, is it uh, a sort of greater, there's greater volatility of changes happening with hormones. And then once you reach menopause at that moment, and now we're into post-menopause, uh, we're starting to see less of those kind of acute uh, symptoms and disruptions to sleep and mood. So around this time of change, from the beginning of symptoms and irregular bleeding to a year after the last period, which we call the perimenopause, this is a time of hormone chaos. Hormone chaos. So but listen one up, woman's listen. hormone chaos may not map to another's. Okay, but this is, seems like it's something that partners should, should listen to. Well, yes, and some women, I classically get a patient comes to see me and says, I made this appointment three months ago. Oh my God, I couldn't sleep. I hadn't had a period for months. I was so anxious. And for the last two months, I've had regular periods and I feel fine. I'm not even sure why I'm here, but then I thought I should come. Mm. And that's classic. That's that like you when get... you break uh, something on your laptop or phone and then you book your appointment and you go into Apple and you show them and it, all of a sudden it's working perfectly. Yep. <laughs> so, so you can have weeks to months of really low estrogen and horrible symptoms, hot flushes, night sweats, irritability, anxiety, and then boom, periods come back your ovaries start working again and everything feels normal. And this can happen on and off for the two, three, four years. And other women, they have regular cycles, bang, never have another period and they never had this horrible experience. Do we know why Why the, the variability? Why would it be, you know, not smooth sailing, I don't want to say that, but, but why would it be, you know, relatively speaking, it's easier for one woman than the next? Um, I make it akin to childbirth. I've had four kids. Every, every pregnancy was different. Every delivery was different. It's just our biologies differ with the, our biology, our own personal biologies differ over time. And between women, there's huge differences, but there's no simple explanation. Okay. Is there any twin studies? Like, do we know if, if, if one twin goes through and, and has, you know, a lot of symptoms, it's very likely the other is experiencing the same thing. Or if your mother had a rough time going through perimenopause. So what we know is if your mother or sister had an early menopause, then genetically you're more likely to have an early menopause. So it's a genetic side. Um, I have seen identical twins have very similar ex transition experiences. I'm not aware of a study of that nature, but I've certainly seen it personally. Um, if your mother had no, a bad menopause experience, it doesn't necessarily mean you will have. I've never seen that mapped. But also, there have been changes over decades in our health. So my mother's childhood nutrition and health was different to mine. But if I had, for women who have postnatal depression or severe premenstrual mood changes, they appear to be more likely to have depressive and anxiety symptoms in the perimenopause. Interesting. So they, they may be more susceptible to mood changes when there's these physiological changes to hormones at various yes. times through their life. Yes. Um, back to the perimenopausal kind of that phase, and you, and you sort of said that 
there may be periods through there where the woman is ovulating. So if we're talking about fertility here, can can a woman fall pregnant during that, that phase? Yes, so it's important for women to be aware that when they're in that change of life transition, perimenopause, that the ovaries can unexpectedly switch on and off. And so the ovaries can turn on, release an egg, and a woman can conceive. So we do counsel women that they are, still have fertility, but I mean, obviously if you had a hysterectomy, you don't, okay? But for women who enter the menopause transition, having had regular cycles before, they may unexpectedly conceive. So um, contraception is certainly important for the first 12 months after the menopause. And if, if a woman is wanting to increase her fertility window, and this might be a question that you get from, from people, uh, perhaps they're planning to have children, they're, I don't know, in their early 40s, um, not unheard of these days, would... Is there anything that you can do to push the perimenopause sort of back a bit? At this stage, we cannot change people's biological clocks. For women who, for example, are going to have some major treatment that will affect the ovaries, so radiotherapy to the pelvis, for example, live with a cancer, um, we can, uh, not me, surgeons can remove segments of ovarian tissue, um, freeze it, store it, and post all the treatment and recovery, reimplant it. So we can preserve ovarian function for young women, but we cannot, if your biological clock is, is about to tick out, mm -hmm. no. So when, when you say biological clock, I think this is such a fascinating thing to think about. So menopause, we think about as aging not as a pathology, that'd be right, given that all women who have not had a hysterectomy get to a certain age later in life, they're going to go through this? Yes, every woman will go through the menopause. Yeah, the, we consider the average age at 51, but between 45 and 55 is the general range of menopause. Um, some women, will, a small few will go through it, you know, 57, 58 years of age. And about 10% of women will go through menopause before the age of 45. And in the order, it depends on what statistics, 2 to 4% of women will lose their ovarian function before the age of 40. And we call that premature ovarian insufficiency. And do we understand the cause of that in that scenario? So if we're looking at women with early menopause, so that's 40 to 45, or premature ovarian insufficiency before the age of 40, there are a number of causes. The majority are not yet identifiable, but about 10% are associated with autoimmune disease like thyroid disease, um, adrenal disease, so it's autoimmune pathology in the ovaries. About 10% are associated with identifiable genetic conditions. Um, and then there are sort of a whole list of rare reasons why women will do it. Um, there's a genetic mutation called Fragile X premutation that we can test for. And then there are all the sort of um, less common genetic syndromes. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of scientists these days interested in longevity and looking at aging and i appreciate this is a a kind of this is peripheral to your primary area of interest and, and research but if we think about menopause as aging and you talk about biological clock do you see a day where there would be an opportunity through medicine to intervene to reverse aging in, in a way that could extend someone's reproductive window so as there is interest in, for example, um, freezing ovarian tissue and then at a later stage re-implanting it. For a woman who goes through menopause at, say, 51, at, at biologically what we would consider a natural menopause, I think there are a lot of um, factors that need to be considered in terms of extending the lifespan of that person's ovarian function because for a woman say 60 there are 
a lot of health implications that could be negative by having the same hormone levels of a woman who is 25. For example, breast cancer risk. If we give, and this is sort of diverging a bit, but if we give estrogen back as hormone replacement therapy, we're not giving it back to the levels that you would see in a 20 year old. We give back very small amounts. So at ovulation, a young girl ovulating could have an estradiol level, a blood estrogen level of 1500. We don't try and reproduce that in a 55 year old with hormone replacement therapy. You only have to give a fraction of that dose to protect the bones and the hearts. Mm -hmm. So there's a potential harm. Yeah, that's a very important point, dose. So that's interesting to know. So from a, a hormone replacement therapy, it's not necessarily about replacing it to optimize for reproduction. No. It's about all of these other things. No. So, re so there's potential harm of restoring reproductive hormone levels to a 60 or 65-year-old woman that, that need to be considered. From an evolutionary point of view, I mean, these hormones, the sex hormones, the, the, is their primary role to help facilitate the, the reproduction? And um, would you say once you've gone past that sort of r reproductive or you've lost your reproductive capability, there would be really no reason to assume that your whatever your hormone status is at that time, let's just say your natural hormone status as a 65 year old woman without intervening is kind of optimal for longevity, right? Because evolution really doesn't care about how well you feel or how strong your bones are when you're 80. Yeah, I mean, we've moved the goalpost as a, as a, a global society. So um, in, one stud, in one time I was looking this up, and in, if I remember correctly, in the 70s in Pakistan, the average life expectancy for a woman was younger than 50 in the early 70s. So the average woman in Pakistan, even in the 70s and 60s and 50s, were not living to menopause. So menopause wasn't a problem. And we've done work with um, Indigenous Australian women in the Kimberley. And whereas they have their rituals for childbirth and death, they don't have rituals for menopause because the average Indigenous woman many years ago did not live through menopause. So it, our hormones were never designed to carry us through to our 80s and 90s and, um, and beyond. Mm -hmm. Which I think is, gets to the heart of probably why approaching this from the perspective of you know, intervening is not natural, might not might not lead to the best outcomes. And I'm sure that's something you come across a bit in conversation or you see online, that's oh, what I The pendulum idea. swings on this, but I want to do it naturally. Well, living to 80 is not really natural if you go back a few decades. So I think that, um, and living to 90 is not natural. I mean, the life expectancy of Australians is just going up and up and up, particularly for women. Before we get into the physiology and what's happening to these various sex hormones that's kind of underpinning a lot of what we're talking about i i want to kind of understand the human experience here so you're you're a woman you you work clinically uh as an endocrinologist and um you know we were chatting off air we had a, a laugh my mo my mother has seen you at some point um so there's a bit of a connection there so you would hear a lot of stories and um you're connected not just to the data that we see and you know if you give someone estrogen plus progestogen, what's the outcomes? That's really interesting and helps us, you know, make uh, a good sort of risk benefit calculation. But from a human experience side, take us inside a woman's life, her mind, as she's transitioning through perimenopause. She's experiencing changes physiologically. How is this manifesting? in terms of how she feels about herself, what her world view is, how that's changing, where she fits in, uh, her connections with family or disconnections with, with family. I'd love to explore that. So there's a huge range of experiences and I think that's incredibly critical to understand. 
and some people become zealots about their experience and write a book and expect everyone to identify with their experience. And I think that can be really helpful, but it can also be confusing. Some women will just, so 25% of women have virtually no symptoms, 20 to 25%. It's not a big deal doesn't mean that there aren't changes that are affecting their biology that we can talk about separately, but for about 20 to 25%, it's not a drama. They don't get anxious. They don't get depressed. Their sleep's not different. And then there are the women who have migraines every month, or, and then suddenly they're like, oh, this is such a relief. And that's despite if you drew their blood, you would see a very similar hormone profile. Yep, yep. And there are other women who... Um, that. You know, the classic symptoms are hot flushes and night sweats. And then I have patients who say, I've never had a hot flush. Do you feel like hot? Oh, I'm just hot all the time. So even the way women will describe their experience of the heat is variable. Some women have terrible flushes during the day, but not at night. Other women literally have to change their bed clothes because they've sweated so much on their sheets, they're lying in the puddle. Um, I think women... Our research is showing that women understand this. I think one of the more, dare I say, even more sinister symptoms that women often do not relate to menopause is anxiety. Irritability they get, you know, they often talk about the seven dwarfs, the sort of the grumpy, the bitchy, the this and that. But anxiety can be a real symptom of menopause where women become irrationally anxious about something minor, panic attacks, and women don't link that to their menopause. So they don't, the trigger, the bells don't ring and they don't, the trigger doesn't go off. Um, so they feel alone, vulnerable, because they don't know what's going on with their body. So a lot of how women experience the menopause, if, if you're empowered with knowledge about what may happen, you can say, oh, this is happening to me, I understand why it's happening. If you don't know why it's happening or what to expect, it's a very frightening and lonely experience. Mm -hmm. Do you think women feel embarrassed? I think it depends on the degree of knowledge a woman has and her social group in terms of family, friends and work. So some, and, and the confidence of that individual. Um, I think where women commonly feel embarrassed today is um, taking HRT. So I still have patients who say, I don't tell anybody I'm taking HRT because they're all going to come at me about, oh, you shouldn't be on that. Did you know it causes breast cancer? Blah, blah, blah. I find women are more embarrassed about that than actually mentioning to friends how they feel. Although the anxiety is embarrassing. What about the low libido aspect? I can imagine that could be somewhat difficult to talk to your physician about. Um, low libido is, again, a complex issue. Many women who have low libido at menopause have probably had it before menopause, unless it's due to vaginal dryness or heavy bleeding or something. But how a woman approaches it and talks about it depends on the relationship with her partner, friends, confidence, and their doctor. So a woman might be more likely to talk about it if she's seeing a gynecologist, for example, than if she's seeing a GP who is much younger or a, a, I've got a... It might, a male older figure GP might be more receptive to a young female GP. Do these changes kind of affect the way a woman may kind of express her her love towards her partner? Like I've heard stories um, from men I know uh, who now in, in hindsight kind of laugh it off, but they did feel disconnected and thought that they had done something or that their, their partner sort of no longer um, loved them in the way that they did. Is this kind of disconnection or feeling of growing apart? Is that... Is that something that's common? It's, I think, I suspect it is very common that there is a disconnection that occurs when a woman experiences loss of libido with a partner. 
I have some patients who say, well, my partner's very understanding and we talk about it, but I'm here because I want to do something about it. And other patients who say, this is really traumatic in our relationship. I've tried to explain it's not that I don't love my partner. You know, I don't, it's not that I don't love you. It's just that I just can't get my head and my body to feel like it used to feel. And I want to feel differently. And I want to be able to be responsive and enjoy sex like we used to. But it's not working. It's not happening for me. And it's not because of you. It's all happening inside of me. How, how good are the available interventions and the, the recommendations that we have? For what? So do, for, 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 uh, for what we're talking about at the moment in terms of the hot flushes, the changes in, in libido or mood, these more acute things as a woman is going through the perimenopause, does... If she is one of those, I think you said 25% experience very little symptoms, but if, if she is one of those that is experiencing symptoms, does she have to experience those symptoms? Is that is that a given for her? Okay, so there's a lot of talk about the perimenopause and the menopause. There are many women who actually don't have terrible symptoms in the perimenopause, but because their ovaries are intermittently working. And soon as they hit the menopause and their ovaries, their estrogen just drops through the floor. That's when their symptoms are horrible. So there is a variation as the timing of individuals. So let's talk about the postmenopause. A woman's ovaries have stopped working. Hot flushes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, sleep disturbance, anxiety, low mood. I'm saying low mood, not clinical depression. Estrogen is incredibly effective at alleviating those symptoms. What's the difference between low mood and clinically diagnosed depression? Uh, clinically diagnosed depression is really continuous um, loss of the ability to find pleasure, to black mood. Um, I mean, there is some at least two weeks of you know, severe down mood, nothing makes you happy, you don't want to get out of bed, you want you can't communicate with people. It's it's profoundly severe. Now it may be exacerbated by the menopause. But before you just throw hormones and say that you should be responding, we you know, there are people with clinical depression who are not going to get back get well with hormones. And so it's a very um important thing that if mood doesn't improve with hormones then you need to start looking at other more profound depressive illness but moving away from that you know low mode um just not feeling women will say i've lost my mojo i i'm just not as happy they're not not getting out of bed they're just saying i'm just not happy i'm not laughing as much i'm anxious i'm irritable that's very responsive now and that's fairly straightforward to treat in most circumstances but when we're talking about the perimenopause women are intermittently making an egg and having their own bleed and the hormones are going up and down so one day the estrogen is extremely low and the next day it's extremely high one day they're sweating and the next day they've got sore breasts and bleeding if you give standard hrt to that patient on the days where their estrogen's mm. high, you can actually make it worse. Right. So it's much harder to intervene if it's being very volatile. Yeah. And there, you can actually worsen symptoms. Does that happen? Would 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 anyone prescribe at that that? Well, phase some people do, life? and you can actually. In the old days, we used to, and we used to find we often make symptoms worse. And what we also do is we cause the onset of a bleed with our artificial regimen. And then they ovulate and have a bleed. And then they're bleeding and not bleeding. And then they don't know when they're bleeding. And so this, and also at this time, women often need contraception. So a common practice in Australia is to give a low dose oral contraceptive pill. And we're very fortunate that we have contraceptive pills here that contain the identical estrogen that we give as HRT. So we, there's a whole range of things we can do that will give cycle control contraception and symptom relief that is not yet HRT. Right. Okay. So perimenopause, different set of interventions yes. than the postmenopausal period yes. uh, phase. And just to kind of, I guess, umbrella 
everything we're talking about here, it seems like there's kind of two big bucket buckets, correct me if I'm wrong. You have those more acute symptoms that we're thinking about and trying to manage to to make uh, that, li- that woman's life more uh, bearable, enjoyable, quality of life going through it. And then there's also, we think we're forecasting out. So we spoke earlier about it's not natural to necessarily be living to 80 to 90 as, as a result of going or uh, reaching menopause, being in the postmenopausal phase these changes in hormones can predispose you to risk of different chronic conditions can can we kind of uh just further define that what are those chronic conditions you sort of said estrogen goes off the cliff so if a woman's listening um and she's one of those that's fortunate not to have the acute symptoms so thinking okay well i got lucky i'll just go through i don't need to worry about any type of intervention what i'm hearing is well actually you'd still want to pay attention because even though you're not experiencing symptoms, your hormones have changed and you could be placing yourself at increased risk of certain conditions later in life. Before we get there though, you do need to be aware that a lot of women think, oh, these symptoms are terrible, but I don't need to take anything because they'll be gone in six months. 42% of women aged 60 to 64 are still having hot flashes and night sweats. So although we describe them as acute, those terrible symptoms can last for decades i see patients in their 70s who are still having hot flushes and night sweats and just assume it's normal well no they just think it's terrible but they they have to put up with it or we treat them for it but um but what i'm saying is for many women the symptoms are the average duration of symptoms is at least seven years so um these are, if a woman's having bad symptoms, they sh- a woman shouldn't think they're just going to go in a few months because they're probably not just going to go in a few mm-hmm. months. That's a good point. But for the woman not having symptoms, the changes that occur at menopause is bone loss. So even a woman with no symptoms, on average, women lose about 6% of their bone over that two or three years of transition. Is that primarily because estrogen falls Because estrogen is falling. Right. Um, women's cholesterol levels can change so their cardiovascular disease risk changes Mm -hmm. as in it goes up it goes up women overall don't tend to gain weight but even if without any weight gain women tend to accumulate central abdominal fat when you accumulate more fat around your tummy that's bad fat which is associated with inflammation cardiovascular disease risk diabetes and some cancers mm-hmm. including breast cancer so is that again that's that's hormone hormone related, dependent right so on average women increase their central abdominal fat by about 20 to 40 percent mm-hmm. you wrote a paper on that um right that we've described that but there's actually studies that have specifically shown that, that that's not my research that they've used um techniques to actually show changes doing doing um scans annually across the transition and showing how much abdominal fat there is and women's risk of diabetes goes up so estrogen has incredibly important actions in terms of metabolic health and how insulin acts in the body so when estrogen levels drop women become more resistant to the effects of insulin and so their risk of diabetes increases so let's dive into estrogen and sex hormones a little bit more here. So uh, ovaries, adrenals, uh, where are the sex hormones being produced? Uh, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, and, and perhaps just kind of an, an overview of how they're changing through this period. So women have two major sources of their sex hormones. They have their ovaries and their adrenals. Now, the ovaries produce hormones with every menstrual cycle. And the main ones we talk about are estrogen, progesterone, which is the hormone that creates the possibility of pregnancy, and testosterone. And it is normal for a woman to produce testosterone from her ovaries. And in fact, testosterone gets converted into estrogen. So testosterone in the ovary gets made into estrogen in the ovary and that helps with fertility. Meanwhile, while the ovaries are doing their things, we've got the adrenal glands producing sex hormones, the most well-known of which is DHEA. 
DHEA is released from the adrenal glands, runs around in the blood, and is taken up by other tissues, fat tissues notably, but also the brain, even the ovaries. And in those tissues, DHEA is converted into estrogen and testosterone. So what happens is you've got the woman premenopausally, ovaries, ovaries and the adrenals all giving her her hormones. When the ovaries stop working at menopause or if they're surgically removed, a woman still has her adrenals. They continue to release DHEA, which then in tissues is made into testosterone and estrogen, some of which just only acts in those tissues and some of which spills over into the bloodstream and goes into other tissues. Right. But because the ovaries are no longer producing estrogen, that's why you get a, a, a net decrease. You get a net decrease. So you get a major loss of estrogen, but the, ov the adrenals still produce quite a lot of hormone that will sustain biological function. Now, adrenal health varies between women. People often talk about this thing called adrenal fatigue. You have to have pretty rubbish adrenals for them not to be producing enough. I think I've seen someone hormone. post online that if you drink a couple cups, cups of coffee a day, you might get adre adrenal yeah. fatigue. <laughs> adrenal fatigue is sort of this wishy-washy thing that unfortunately people with fatigue are then told they've got adrenal fatigue and they're putting on, on, on DHEA or other things to, to boost their adrenals. And it's a lot of nonsense, really. Um, the amount of DHEA that's produced is in buckets loads. There's plenty in everybody unless you've got adrenal failure. So what about the other idea that I see out there is people talking about estrogen dominance. You've seen that? Yeah, I mean... There's no question that during that period of hormonal chaos, estrogen levels will fluctuate quite wildly in some women. And the ovaries are not having their normal function, so they're not necessarily producing enough progesterone to keep the lining of the uterus thin. And women might have very sore breasts or might have very heavy bleeding. But it's not really something that you would treat you don't go and fill her up with progesterone to balance the hormones this whole thing of balancing hormones again is a bit of nonsense if i could balance someone's hormones i'd probably win the nobel prize because i can't predict someone's hormones i don't know how much hormone a woman needs when women ovulate some women ovulate with an estradiol of 500 picomoles per liter other women ovulate with a level of 2000 and i can't and ovulate that level can vary in a woman from week to week and month to month. So we have no way of predicting what is perfect for a woman. Mm -hmm. And how variable is the kind of range when a woman's going through perimenopause? Actually, let's say that moment of menopause, if you were to measure, go out to population in Australia and measure testosterone, estrogen, um, progesterone and you were to look at that how variable is that are they all within a tight range or is there sort of great variability oh there's still substantial variability but after menopause now it depends on how it's measured so if i send a blood sample to one laboratory in melbourne they'll tell me that the post-menopausal level is less than 100 picomoles per liter. If I send it to another lab, they might tell me it's less than 120, another lab 200. Not because they disagree, it's what's been shown as how that testing method performs. Not all testing methods are equal. So you can't get, a woman can't get her level done in one laboratory and say, oh, this week was 80, but next in another laboratory was 150 because they're not using the same methodology. So women have to be careful of that. So test and retest at the same laboratory. Always the same laboratory, but we don't normally test estrogen levels at menopause. They're low. And the abdominal fat piece, how does that tie in? Is that a, a way for the body to produce more estrogen at this stage where estrogen uh, levels in the body have gone down or, or why this kind of... Um, predisposition to all of a sudden now storing more fat around the abdomen? 
I have no answer to this, but for example, a lovely example is that there have been a few men identified, a handful in the world, who lack the enzyme that converts testosterone to estrogen. So these men cannot make estrogen. And when you'd say, well, so what? Which is another good point because many people think men, like estrogen is bad for men. It's like the flip side of testosterone. Yeah, men need estrogen. <laughs> so these men have been identified that cannot make estrogen. They're all tall because their growth plates haven't closed. Osteo- they have osteoporosis. They have central abdominal fat. They have fatty livers. And um, premature um, deposits of fat in their carotid arteries. And then it's one particular example that was um, a gentleman identified in South America. And so he was treated with testosterone because initially they thought he was testosterone deficient, but he wasn't. And in fact, when he was treated with an estrogen patch, his bone density went up, his... um, fatty liver resolved, his fat in his arteries went away or decreased, and his abdominal fat decreased. And that's a classic male example of what happens at menopause. And why does it happen? Simply because estrogen is incredibly important in men and in women for metabolism and fat metabolism and bone health. Yeah, I'm not sure how politically correct this is, but it's women that have said it to me. So I'll say it. They, there, there's this uh, menopause belly is often used to describe this, right? I'm not sure if you've heard that. Um, it's probably not very politically correct, but it speaks to the fact that many women are dealing with this. So I'm glad that we're talking about it. Um, has that been has that been looked at? in a population of women have they been treated with estrogen and then um where where they're depositing fat has been measured and and we've seen it change well we know that whatever you do that the menopause transition causes injury you know abdominal waistlines go up we know that and there's this beautiful study done a number of years ago um that looked at whether hormone replacement therapy would protect women who already had heart disease, okay? But what they did was they randomized women to oral estrogen with progestogen or placebo for three years. And in the women who got the oral estrogen therapy, they had less increase in their waist circumference over three years less and less weight gain over three years compared to women who got placebo, showing that estrogen protects against central abdominal fat gain and general weight gain overall. And the protection against weight gain also includes satiety centers, the brain. So you're actually less hungry if you have more estrogen. And sleep has a big role. So when you sleep deprive people, they're their metabolic clocks in the body change. So people don't realize that our body clock is not simply in our brain that detects day and night. Our livers have a clock. And if you eat at the wrong time, you confuse the liver and your cholesterol goes up at the wrong time. So shift workers are more likely to gain weight and have poor metabolism than people who don't do shift work. And that also partly explains the sleep disruption due to low estrogen, also partly explains the weight gain, the high cholesterol, the cardiovascular disease risk, the diabetes risk. So it's a very complex puzzle. Mm, And intertwined, interrelated. Mm. Um, Yeah, that's interesting. I've seen a few studies where they've looked at sleep deprivation and been able to show that it could increase uh, susceptibility to store visceral fat fat around the abdomen. Um, I want to deep dive into menopause hormone therapy and the guidelines and who it's indicated for and possibly who it's not indicated or contraindicated for Um, but one other question that i that just came to mind is in your in a woman's 20s or 30s are there there are things that that you can do during that period to kind of optimize your health or um, hormone status to um 
improve your outcomes post-menopause? So I'm not going to be politically correct. <laughs> if I had a magic wand and I could wave it across Australia to improve the overall health of women, the menopause experience of women, and the health of women after menopause, it would be to reduce overweight and obesity. And in our study of 7,000 women that aged 18 to 39 who were representative of Australian women of that age, 45% are already overweight and obese. And the figures vary, but 50, over 55, 65% of women after menopause are overweight or obese. And that is the single thing that is impacting not only the menopause experience, not only pregnancy and reproductive health, but also health after menopause. And so we know that women who are overweight and have obesity have more face hot flushes and night sweats and more severe menopausal symptoms. So that is one. And then you're going to have more cardiovascular risk. You're going to have more osteoarthritis. You're going to have more everything. So it is apparently it's not politically correct to say it, but that is one of our major health problems in this country. Yeah. I mean, I don't see that as politically incorrect. I just probably, I guess, solving obesity is more complex than maybe some people think. Yeah, um, it's very know, complicated. As you would know, there's a whole bunch of pieces to that, the, the food environment. And yeah, social, the social drivers, social the drivers. food, yeah, everything. So um, but that would be the one said thing. Than done, but there are going to be some individuals yeah. who can, you know, make changes and, and it's good to know. Um, yeah, and what we know is that there is an age-related creep in weight gain that is not biologically determined, it's environmentally determined. So if a woman notices, oh, I've put on a kilo, oh, it's only a kilo, don't say that. Say, i put on a kilo, not good, I'm not going to get hysterical, but I'm going to change that. Don't wait till you put on 10 kilos because it's much harder to get away with, ten, to drop 10, and it's even hard to get drop 20. But what about the idea that, look, I'm 60, I'm 65, you know, my metabolic rate has just dropped, you know, that's why I've gained weight. Um, is there truth to that? Is it much harder for a woman to kind of balance her energy and stay at, a, at an optimal weight as she has reached um, put that post-menopause phase of her life? Oh, look, definitely that, as I've said, there are metabolic changes with estrogen dropping. If that woman's on an HRT, for example, she is going to be in a different metabolic place to a woman whose body's full of estrogen and other hormones. And Is she burning less energy just from a basal metabolic rate? I, I can't answer that because one of the things that really needs to be studied is we have white fat and brown fat. And one of my colleagues is desperate to do a study looking at burning of brown fat and whether it changes at menopause and we don't know that and we need to know that but it, it i suspect it does change from what the preliminary data suggests but having said that i think our activity changes our subliminal activity changes our dietary pattern changes and i think that people are not sufficiently ob objective of their incidental activity and their incidental eating, that they don't really have a meal. I'll, sh I'll just have that biscuit or I'll just have that snack. And it doesn't even register. And I'm not critical of people. It, it happens. It happens to all of us. But it's very easy for your incidental activity to drop. Mm -hmm. I know that my mum's always seems to be baking me sweets now. <laughs> Anytime I visit her, I leave with a, a big thing of sweets. Um, not that I, I, I don't enjoy them. Friends, just a quick intermission to tell you about my brand new recipe book, Plant-Based Ferments, a collection of must-have recipes that will take your fermented food game to the next level, nourishing your microbiome and saving you dollars on your grocery bill at the same time. The soy labneh and homemade kombucha are probably my favorites. I'm often asked by folks in the community how best to support my work. I don't sell much, but if you have been getting value from the show and you want to show your support and improve your gut health, 
then check out plant-based ferments. It's $12, has a few thousand words I wrote on fermented foods, including some frequently asked questions and 15 recipes that are professionally shot and styled. To get your copy, head to theproof.com forward slash ferments. Uh, let's go into the guidelines. So you're involved in writing them. Um, how are the guidelines for, for menopause constructed, created? What's the process and why are they kind of important um, for us to kind of to consider and important for physicians to, to refer to? Perfect timing. Um, we've got a big NHMRC grant to um, develop update guidelines for health practitioners and embed them in algorithms into software. So what we've been doing, my extraordinary team, who I would like to acknowledge at Monash, um, we've done what's called a systematic search. So we have searched the literature for all the published guidelines, consensus statements, position statements since 2015 on menopause. And we have then used a process to identify how they've been constructed. Now, we found a small number, can't give it away yet because we haven't published the paper, but there are a small number who that have been constructed using very rigorous methods. So for example, when they've looked at what are the symptoms of menopause, they've done a search of the literature and they've done Everything's based on evidence and they've done a very robust evidence-based and they have described in their guideline how that's been done. There are other ones where people sit around the table and say, well, I think this and my experience is that. And there's, so there's a huge dimension. So there are the good guidelines and the ones that still come up with the same ideas, but they haven't been constructed with the same rigor. So you end up with a and often the, the best guidelines tend to come from medical societies that have membership with a great interest in this space and they've dedicated some money to support the development and the methodology. What we've found is that, and they're important because if they're very high caliber guidelines, they really do bring together what is known and synthesized. And they say, this is what we know, this is what we don't know, and this is the maybe stuff. And this is what we know is bad. And what they consistently show from what we've done is that there's complete agreement in the major symptoms of menopause, which we've talked about already. The flushes, the sweats, the sleep disturbance. There's consistent agreement in that the most effective treatment for menopause is hormone replacement therapy. There's a consistent agreement that for a woman over the age of 45, if they stop having periods or their symptoms are a bit off, if they've got symptoms, you don't need to do blood tests. Women under 45, you should do blood tests. And then they start to diverge a bit about what should be given, because that's often guided by the country in which the guidelines developed and what's available. But in general, the guidelines indicate that for menopause with symptoms, the, the benefits out of hormone therapy outweigh the risks. And then there's some subtle difference about whether hormone therapy should be used to treat osteoporosis or not, but that usually depends on whether it's approved in that country for that indication. So in general, they agree. Interestingly, they all consistently say that there's insufficient evidence that hormone therapy will prevent dementia or cognitive decline. Which doesn't mean it doesn't or it could there it just be a lack of... There is insufficient evidence right. to tell... You should not say to a person, you should be on hormone therapy because it'll help you protect mm -hmm. you against dementia. The jury's out. The jury's out. Okay. But there's not evidence to say that it doesn't or it makes it worse. No, there's... The jury's out. Mm -hmm. But therefore, you shouldn't prescribe it for that sole purpose. Gotcha. Okay. So that's the hormone therapy side of things, which I want to dig into a little bit more and talk about some of the trials and, and breast cancer risk and um, all of that, the, the risk uh, benefit kind of ratio. But what about in the guidelines, do they, do they discuss uh, exercise or diet or is there also insufficient evidence for, the, for those things? There's no evidence that exercise will improve menopausal symptoms. 
the available data for exercise and bone health is just going for a walk around your local gardens is not going to cut it. You need to do exercise that includes impact. And you, of course, I suspect know all about that. Um, cognitive behaviour therapy will diminish a woman's adverse experience of hot flushes and may reduce anxiety. So all the guidelines support the use of cognitive behaviour therapy if it's accessible. It's not always accessible. It can be expensive, time-consuming, etc. Um, the guidelines are very mixed in terms of phytoestrogens and um, black cohosh, really conflicting in what some say no evidence for benefit, don't recommend. Others say there may be benefit. When it comes to things like yoga, acupuncture, um, rhubarb, all those other things, no, there's consistent evidence of no benefit or lack of evidence. Um, acupuncture is one of them where the evidence is not there, that there's clinical trials have not shown benefit. Does it frustrate you that there's it seems like there's an abundance of evidence to support hormone therapy for the right person, but some of these other things get more airtime or are pushed sort of more aggressively? Um, yeah, I mean, I I'm feel sorry for women who will spend a fortune on over-the-counter stuff that is of absolutely no benefit before they take hormone therapy, and you'll be horrified to know that our... Um, study of primary care physicians and pharmacists show that they acknowledge that most of the over-the-counter products are useless, but they will recommend them before hormone replacement therapy because that's what women want to hear from them. Do you think this is a misunderstanding of the potential risks, like from an absolute point of view, putting them into context, what, what are they, and also perhaps not even registering the fact that you know a supplement anything could come with a risk and we probably should hold any of these compounds or you know to the same sort of rigor of 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 evidence that we expect if we're assessing efficacy and safety yeah i think everything that anybody's going to take for a symptom particularly if it's going to hit your hip pocket and and, and that's you know i've seen people spend a lot of money on nonsense um i think everything should have clear um evidence and for eff effectiveness and safety. And if it's sold with no evidence, they, women should be told the truth. There's no evidence of effectiveness or safety. Um, from our research, and these are published papers, women will go for the alternative over-the-counter stuff first because their fear is breast cancer. And the, it's been drummed into women over the last couple of the last two decades that basically you're pretty wimpy if you need hormone replacement therapy tough it out and the symptoms are going to go away from the point of view of the healthcare providers altogether gynecologists primary care physicians pharmacists whatever there are two things one they feel that women want to be told you're a really good doctor if you do the natural therapy stuff because the there's the integrative doctor down the road they'll go and see if you don't recommend it and makes you a really good person because you're saying, well, why don't you just try that black cohosh first, even though you think it's not going to work and they may or may not come back and the placebo effect's fabulous. And also, they've told us, we don't know how to prescribe HRT. We're not confident. And we go down that path um, and they come back with bleeding. We don't know what to do. Right. So there's fear at the patient level, fear at the pre prescriber level. Yeah, here. so it's so a mess. These, these are challenges, barriers. Uh, am I right that a lot of this stems back to the Women's Health Initiative yes. trials? Let's go through those. So in the 1990s, there was evidence to suggest hormone replacement therapy prevented heart disease. In fact, to the point that we actually did a study where we gave men with heart disease estrogen. And so in the US, a big study was set up called the Women's Health Initiative. And in that, there were two arms one with women who had not had a hysterectomy and they were given estrogen and progestin or placebo, 11,000 women. Am I gonna have this around the right way? No, 16,000 women. Large study. Um, and they were followed for five years. 
The other group were women that had a hysterectomy. They were given estrogen or placebo and followed up. Interestingly, that's the aim of the study was, does HRT compared to placebo prevent heart disease? And why was one group given, was it progestogen? So if a woman has had a hysterectomy, they don't need the progestin mm. because they haven't got a uterus. Okay. We only give the progestin to pr pr protect the uterus against thickening up. Right. And so there was women in the study both that had a uterus and didn't have... Two arms. One so arm hysterectomized, mm -hmm. estrogen versus placebo. Another arm, no hysterectomy, estrogen plus progestin versus placebo. And you give them the progestin if they have their uterus intact because you want to lower the risk of endometrial cancer. Uterine cancer, yep. Gotcha. So everybody got the same estrogen, um, conjugated estrogen in a tablet or placebo. And interestingly, it was predicted that there may be an increased risk of breast cancer. After five years in the estrogen plus progestin study, there appeared to possibly be a small increased risk of breast cancer. The um, safety monitoring committee had a little panic attack and they stopped the study prematurely. Bang. That wasn't seen in the estrogen only study, which went out to on average seven years of treatment. That study, there appeared that there might be a small increased risk of stroke. And because the other one had stopped, they had a little panic attack too. Bang, the study was stopped. Altogether, there are about 27,000 women in these studies. These were huge studies, mm. cost you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars. So all of the women would have come off of hormone replacement at that time? So they would, out of the study, what women then chose to do in their personal lives was different. Now, the study was geared to see if women at an average age of 63 years at the beginning of the study would have less heart disease if they were given estrogen. That's not the average age of menopause. So the women were recruited into the study if they were aged 50 to 79. Mm. So many this, of those are perimenopause. Very few of them were perimenopause. Oh, very few are peri. This study tells you nothing about women who went through menopause before the age of 50. Mm -hmm. You had to be 50 to get into the study. And the average age of women in the study was 63. Mm -hmm. So on average, women were at least 13 years post-menopause, at least. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so intervening pretty late. So it was a late intervention study. And their headlines in the newspaper when the first paper came out was HRT causes breast cancer across the world. And of course, everybody panicked. As a consequence of this study, HRT just went off the radar. Mm. People stopped prescribing. Did they look at other outcomes? I thought they also looked they at- They looked at other outcomes. Um, there was clear evidence that there was a massive reduction in osteoporosis and fracture. Even in women who did not have osteoporosis, the fracture rate was reduced. Um, it's the only medication ever shown to dramatically reduce fracture rates in women without osteoporosis. Um, there was an increased risk of thrombosis, deep vein thrombosis, which occurred mostly in the first 18 months of use. And this is what we know happens with estrogen tablets. You don't tend to see it with estrogen patches or gels. Um, for women aged 50 to 59 there were, who went in the study, there was no increased risk of cardiovascular disease. There was a small increased risk of stroke in some of the greater age groups. For women who got estrogen only, so, so the... The estrogen plus progestion study, bam, closed five years. The other one's still going, estrogen only. That stopped at seven years. When they stopped that, the women who got estrogen only had a lower risk, borderline lower risk of breast cancer compared to women who got placebo. 
Yeah, I think I saw that summarized in the in the NAMS position yeah. statement. Is that, been, a, is that a good position statement? Yeah, the NAMS one's quite good. Right. So now we've got one study showing estrogen progestion causes breast can may cause breast cancer. Increasing risk, yeah. Another study showing that if you take had a hysterectomy and take estrogen, you've got a, possibly a low risk of breast cancer. What's really important is the 20 year follow-up of these studies. 20 years out from these studies, it shows that overall, there is no difference in all cause death or death from any specific cause such as um, cancer, heart disease, breast cancer, except there appears to be possibly a lower rate of death from Alzheimer's disease. Fascinating. But you wouldn't say that it's not, it, it's, we're talking about statistical significance. You've got to treat thousands of people to maybe see one difference. But what this is telling us is 20 years down the track from the Women's Health Initiative study, that involve women taking either estrogen only for an average of seven years or estrogen plus progestin for an average of five years, 20 years down the track, you weren't more likely to die from pretty well anything, whatever you did. So does HRT kill you? No. Does it save you? No. If you've got symptoms, should you take it? Probably. Is it is it this data where the recommendations come to the, the, the sort of... Uh, advice to take HRT within 10 years of menopause? Why 10 years? So the initial WHI data comes out. Studies are being published at a rate that you can't even keep up with what's coming out and being published. Analysis after analysis after analysis. And then the later analysis shows, oh, we shouldn't have worried so much in the beginning, but everyone worried in the beginning. So it's very hard to take a bad thought out of people's brains. Once it's hit mainstream media, tough to undo that. Yeah, it's very hard to unpick. And people didn't know what to do. So what do you do? You come up with some reassuring consensus. Why don't we tell women that, well, we're in the WHI study, it didn't seem to have any ill effects in women who were aged 50 to 59 when they started HRT or within 10 years of menopause. What we'll do is we'll tell women, we'll put in a consensus, we'll feel pretty safe. You can take HRT if you're within 10 years of menopause or aged less than 60. Now, I've still never got my head around this one because what happens if you go through menopause at 55 and then you're 61? You're not between the age of 50 and 60, but you're within 10 years of menopause. Where does that put you? I don't think anyone's ever really worked this out. And that stuck because everybody felt safe. The so experts, what's your view? What's your view on... on uh, there's no evidence base for that guideline. Mm -hmm. And the experts, it made the experts it feel safe. It made the community feel safe. And we all like to feel safe. Um, we now recommend that... Each individual has to look at their risks and potential gains. And in general, taking that into account, hormone replacement therapy can be taken for as long as there's a reason to take it. Now, for some women, it's protection against bone loss and fracture. For other women, every time they sit, stop it, at the age of 66, 67, 71, they miss a few tablets or patches, they just can't function with the symptoms. You have the conversation and they may continue to take it at a modified dose as a patch not a tablet whatever you mentioned dementia before but acutely is, is brain fog like fuzziness is that another clarity lack of clarity is that another symptom brain fog is a symptom everyone talks about and it's very difficult to separate it from um, hot flushes estrogen and sleep deprivation if you don't sleep, you don't function. Anyone who's had a period of stress and bad sleep will know you have brain fog. The combined studies at the moment show that women during the perimenopause and the early menopause have reduced what we call verbal fluency, so you can't remember words. That actually seems to 
recover over time, even without HRT. Um, whether women adapt, whether sleep improves, whatever. But the evidence that HRT improves cognitive function mm -hmm. is lacking. Lacking. Okay. Well, academics out there, there's an area to research. It's a really important area. Mm -hmm. So the, the breast cancer risk, let's, yep. let's just double click on that. And I think that's, you know, that's something a lot of people are interested in. Usually I hear about breast cancer risk, blood clots, or cardiovascular disease risk when people are talking about HRT. But I think breast cancer risk is probably gets the most attention. So I've got a couple of questions here. Um, one is, what is that risk in terms of like absolute terms? If we're trying to quantify that, maybe relative to having a glass of wine or being overweight, you know, is, is the risk is worse if you're overweight or obese, right? If you over overweight, this is from UK analysis of old studies. But if you're overweight, um, Val Beryl, who is a famous epidemiologist, um, sadly, recently passed on. Her data shows that overweight so is associated with a 20% on average increase in breast cancer risk and obesity of 40%. The worst case scenario of traditional estrogen plus progestogen tablets, common garden variety, the increased risk is about 30%. So somewhere between overweight and obese. What about a woman who has a history of breast cancer? We do not treat women with past breast cancer with hormone therapy. It is close to as you will get for an absolute contraindication. There are very, very rare examples where in consultation with the treating cancer specialist and the patient, that the symptoms of her menopause are so dire that we will treat with estrogen, but that's the absolute exception. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned their garden variety. So when HRT pops up, uh, inevitably there's discussion around gels and patches and there's different forms. There's uh, serms, estrogen with serms I've seen, which might be another option to progestogen and then tribolone or tibolone forgive my ignorance here, but there seems to be quite a few different options. So uh, for a woman that uh, with a uterus and she's wanting to um, take HRT or consider it, what are those various different options that are available? Okay, so let's walk through this. So woman with a uterus needs to take estrogen with a progestogen. That can be um, as a tablet or in a patch and also can be as a long-term IUD that's inserted, covered in the proge synthetic progestin that will last for several years. And it's a, that's a matter of choice. So let's put that one, the IUD one, aside. Um, and let's firstly walk through the estrogens. Estrogen can be as a tablet or it can be transdermal as a patch or a gel. Same safety profile? No, they differ. So estrogen, when you take it as a tablet, the full dose goes into your gastrointestinal tract and hits your liver in one burst. When it hits the liver in one burst, it can alter clotting factors, which increase the likelihood for blood to clot. So it increases the risk of DVT deep venous thrombosis and in the women's health initiative studies that was particularly associated with women having a lower limb fracture like being immobilized okay or people with a predisposing tendency to thrombosis and just like in the pill uh, just like with the oral contraceptive pill people are at increased risk of thrombosis if they have obesity or if they are a smoker so we don't like to give estrogen as a tablet to people who are overweight, obese, or smokers, or have a predetermined, a pre-known risk for thrombosis. And that can be given as estradiol, and it is broken down, and it gives you a 24-hour cover. If um, It also will lower cholesterol, okay? But it increases, it, it can change your blood fats. 
Um, the other group we don't tend to give it in oral estrogen to is diabetics because it can lower cholesterol but increase other blood fats. Then you can have estrogen as a patch or a gel. Great option. Um, some people say the patch has to be changed either once a week or twice a week, so you've got to remember to do it. A lot of women forget. And so women, some women say, I'd rather take a tablet every day. I don't want to wear a patch or a gel that you use daily. And then there are some women that don't absorb patches or gels. They just, it just doesn't work through the skin. We try them, we, they still have their symptoms and we actually measure their blood level a day after they first put it on and they're just not absorbing it. Are there but, some options for application locally for painful sex, for example? That I've or vaginal estrogen in very low dose. But if we're trying to treat hot flushes and night sweats, you're going to give a tablet, a patch or a gel of estrogen. At standard doses, not very ultra high doses, patches and gels do not, they drip feed through the skin. So you don't get the increased risk of thrombosis. You don't get quite as favorable cholesterol lowering, but you don't get the triglyceride increase. So diabetics, overweight women, um, women who are smokers, we will give a patch or a gel. And we will even in circumstances with consultation, give those to women who have even had a past thrombosis according to the whole situation. Um, so that's pretty straightforward. How are you, I'm conscious of your point earlier about physicians being fearful of prescribing this, not knowing how to prescribe it or just feeling uncomfortable. How, how are you determining dose of these various different applications? Is that based on, on some form of lab result? Is it based on symptoms? Oh, dose. Um, did I open a can of worms? Dose is very difficult. <laughs> um, smokers always need more because they chew through the estrogen. I would, pr I go softly, softly. So I usually underdose, review women after a few weeks, usually on average six weeks, because I would rather the patient come back and I warn them of this. I say, I'm gonna go cautiously with the dose. I would rather come, you come back and tell me you're not bleeding heavily or you don't have sore breasts, or you don't have any other side effects, and we can increase the dose. So you might come back and say, I'm still flushing, I'm still waking at night, but we can up the dose. But I can go with a sledgehammer do dose, and you're gonna come back, or you won't come back because you're bleeding so much, or you stopped taking it because your breasts were so sore, and you don't even wanna see me again. Always cautiously up. Um, it's the most practical, if someone's gonna be on this, for one, two, three, four, five years, take a few, take two or three months or four months or six months to get it right. So you're trying to find the lowest effective dose. The lowest effective dose. By, it's, is this because I'm scared of breast cancer? No, it's just common sense. Mm -hmm. Right. That you go, you know, we don't take the highest dose to treat blood pressure. We take the lowest effective dose because everybody knows the more you take of anything, the more likely you're going to get a side effect, whatever that might be even if it's a skin rash with the patch. So lowest effective dose. And then you have to balance the, how much progestogen you're going to give. Now I am using that term progestogen. Mm. Let's clar clarify that, how, how that's different to progesterone. So everything that has an effect on the lining of the uterus that causes the same changes that we would like to see that's appropriate like progesterone would work is called a progestogen. Amongst that is pure progesterone like our bodies make, men and women. And everything else is synthetic. Well, they're all, even the progesterone we give comes from a lab. It does not come from a plant. There is no estrogen plant, there's no progesterone plant. We can make progesterone in the laboratory. It's biologically, it's structurally identif identical to what our bodies make and we can give that. Alternatively, everything else is a synthetic progestin or progestogen, a synthetic progestin. So progesterone is the sort of, um, we believe the gold standard therapy. It often um, can give women improves, we give it at night. It gives women in many instances improved sleep to the point that some women can't tolerate it, they're still sleepy the next morning and they don't want to take it. So you're actually, you're actually taking that as a, as a 
a patient pill. as a person, you're taking that separately to your estrogen. It doesn't come yes. in a combined formula. No, uh, there is there is a formulation available that combines estrogen and progesterone as a tablet, but there's none that combine it as a patch or a gel because progesterone is very poorly absorbed through the skin. Please note that all you people out there who are using progesterone creams. <laughs> um, then you can take it as a patch or you can take it as a tablet, um, either combined with estrogen or alone, and we prescribe it at night because it can improve sleep and it protects the lining of the uterus. In some women, it is not potent enough to protect their uterine lining. They will still have bleeding and we use the synthetic progestins. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, presently it is only on private scripts, so that sometimes limits its availability. Its availability varies. I know you have international li listeners. The availability of all these products vary globally. Um, in many instances, we I will still prescribe synthetic progestins initially because I want to make sure when a woman's coming out of their menopause transition, even if they haven't had a period for a while, we talked about the fact that the adrenals make hormones that can be made into estrogen in fat. Women can still have a slightly thickened lining of the uterus. And I want to thin it down and have control of it. That's to lower the risk of cancer. Well, to lower the risk of breakthrough bleeding, really. Okay. So quite often I will use a synthetic progestin initially, particularly if someone's overweight and has more fat that can make estrogen, and then I'll transition her across to natural estrogen. So my initial goal is always to control symptoms and say to patients, you may just be on this for a short time, but let's just... Let's get rid of the hot flushes and night sweats. Let's just get you sleeping. Let's not have you bleeding. Let's get it right and then we will fine tune. Let's start with low dose. Let's get it right and then we'll fine tune. And some women just cannot tolerate the natural progesterone. I say natural, body identical progesterone. Some women cannot tolerate patches. They get skin rashes. They get welts. They get whole body rashes. They don't absorb it and we have to use tablets. So I think this whole holy grail that you must be on an estrogen patch or gel and progesterone to get gold standard HRT, it doesn't work for everyone and women shouldn't feel bad that it's not working for them. So there's different options, but the biggest point here that, that I'm sort of taking away is that if, if you have a uterus, you have to balance somehow the estrogen you're taking with a progestogen. Yes. That could be a body identical progesterone. It could be um, the progestogen that you just spoke about there. What about serms or um, so, tibolone? Going to tibolone first because it's the easiest. Tibolone was a medication initially developed, maybe used for use of breast cancer. It was developed in, in the Netherlands. And then through its the study of it, it became known that it actually relieved menopausal symptoms. And tibolone is taken as a tablet, it goes into the gut and it's broken down. And the three v things it's broken down into have actions like estrogen, progesterone and testosterone in a woman's body. Weak actions so, and it is highly effective like alleviating hot flushes, night sweats, vaginal dryness, um, anxiety, etc. So why don't we put everybody on it? Because it's not all that it's not all that strong. So some women will still have hot flushes, night sweats, despite the use of it. Some women get weight gain on it, but not everybody. And some women get fluid retention. I'm, I'm giving it a bad sell. Some women, it's magic. Mm. But it's life changing. Do we have long term data in terms of osteoporosis and other outcomes like that? It's almost as effective as bone drugs in preventing fracture in women with osteoporosis. It's incredibly effective in protecting against bone loss, even at the half dose that's used to treat hot flushes and night sweats. So I have a lot of patients who take half a tablet of Tibolone primarily to protect mm. their bones. And is that also contraindicated if you've had breast cancer and gone yes. through a uh, treatment that's depleted your estrogen? It is equally contraindicated after breast cancer. 
Um, however, it in women at an average age of menopause, it has not been associated with an increased breast cancer risk. So in the scheme of things, Tibolone is a remarkably safe drug. Yes, it's totally synthetic, or it's, although it's synthesized from the Mexican yam. It is chance finding as a medication. And for women in whom it's effective, it's incredibly safe and highly effective. Mm -hmm. And SERMs? So SERMs are compounds that can sit in the estrogen receptor. And some, in some tissues act like estrogen and in some tissues act like an anti-estrogen. Would isoflavone, would the phytoestrogens, would they fall under this category? Sort phytoestrogens of? are not really SERMs. Some people would talk about them as SERMs, but they're not really SERMs. Okay. They're sort of SERMs. But, but, but compounds that can bind to the estrogen receptor, and well, some tissues have estrogen effect and the others have the opposite. Yes. And um, a classic one people will have heard of is tamoxifen, which is used to treat breast cancer. So tamoxifen acts as an estrogen blocker in the breast. So it's used to treat breast cancer. It acts as an estrogen blocker probably in the brain. So many women get hot flushes. But in the uterus, it has some weak estrogen action. So some women get thickening of the uterine lining with tamoxifen. Not all, but some. So we are aware of that. In bone, it has a weak sort of estrogen effect, so women don't tend to lose a lot of bone on tamoxifen. Um, other ones, raloxifene blocks estrogen in the breast, but acts like estrogen in the bone, and initially was approved to treat osteoporosis, but it's not all that potent, and a lot of women get side effects in terms of flushes. So assume something that you use clinically, when would you use serums over say uh, progesterone so there was a formulation made available that is low dose estrogen with a serum called basidoxifen to treat menopause so using the serum to block estrogen in the breast and the uterus but not in the bones it is it didn't have huge uptake because some women found it good but a lot of women found that it didn't give them adequate estrogen symptom relief. And therefore they tried it, but they're still getting hot flushes. So it hasn't been available for a while globally. There was some production line issue. Um, I believe it's becoming available again, but it is not as powerful in alleviating symptoms as other estrogens because you can't really vary the dose. What's this concept or idea of bio-identical hormones? Are they, are they the same thing as what you're talking about or are they different? So many years ago, or when I started in this field, we only had access to totally synthetic estrogens that were not the same molecular biology as the molecular structure of what our bodies make. Subsequently, we have estradiol, which our bodies make, and progesterone, which our bodies make, that is available, commercially available, and approved by our regulators in Australia and regulators in Europe, South America, FDA in America, etc. And I can prescribe these. But what emerged over the last 20 years when all the fear mongering occurred about HRT was that doctors started to prescribe what they called bioidentical hormones. This is simply um, the same as what I'm talking about. But instead of me writing a script for something that's been approved by our regulator, the TGA, I write a script for Mary Jones. Um, so many milligrams of estradiol with estrone, which is another form of estrogen, as a cream, as a gel, as a lozenge you suck. And so many milligrams of estrogen, of progesterone. And I give that you that prescription and you take it to the pharmacy and they go out the back and they prepare it for you. Now the problem with that is the doses are best guess. There's no evidence that a particular dose formulated in this way Eyes, something you suck in your mouth, something you rub on your skin, will be absorbed. 
or if it's absorbed, is it absorbed at low levels, so you're not absorbing much, or extremely high levels? So I've seen women rubbing on creams with estrogen levels in the th multiple thousands. And does it work? Is it safe? We don't know. Well, is there, is there an assumption out there that it is safer? Because I see people are very passionate about saying, no, 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 no. It's safe. Don't there do is HRT, no you should do bioidentical. Well, firstly, what I prescribe 99% of the time is bioidentical. And whether you rub it in your ear, put it on your toes, swallow it, wear a patch or a gel, put up your vagina, estrogen is estrogen is estrogen. If, if 17 beta estradiol is, that's what it is. And if it goes through from externally to internally and circulate in your blood, it is the same hormone. So that's not safer because somebody's written you in script. In fact, it may be more dangerous because you don't know how much you're getting. And then this idea that you can monitor the blood levels or your blood level's not right. We don't know what blood level a woman should have to be effective or safe because it varies between women. Some women have no hot flushes with a slow blood level and some women are still sweating and waking up at night with a high blood level because it's her biology. So there's a lot of Do you think people, mystique. Yeah. Do you think people feel that with those ones that are compounded, they're, you know, not controlled by big pharmaceutical companies? I feel like there is a, a sort of section, particularly today, who might be listening to this conversation, thinking about this topic and thinking, big pharma just wants women to to get on these hormones, become reliant on them for the rest of their life. There's a lot of, of money up for grabs here. Is that something, I mean, I'm sure you've come across that. I'm sure people ask if you're paid by big pharmaceutical companies. Like, What are your general thoughts about that? So conflict of interest decla declaring, I consult with many big pharma companies. I consult with them because I do research and they ask me questions and I tell them honestly what I think. Um, I don't advertise their drugs, but I do speak to them. And I get paid to talk for the talking to them. So I, that's my declared conflict of interest. Pharmaceutical companies invest multiple millions to develop drugs that they have to prove are effective. So if you get 100 people and they all take that medication that they pretty well get the same blood level and that they're effective, they do what they said they're meant to do. So the majority of women, they get symptom relief and they have to do safety data. They have to prove that it protects the lining of the uterus. So if you have a combined estrogen progestin patch, for example, or an estrogen progestin tablet, they've done studies to show if you take that combination out of a thousand women, compared to placebo, there's no increased risk of uterine cancer. It's protecting the lining of your uterus. Are they bad? Are they making money? They're not bad. Their job is to make money because they have shareholders, um, like insurance companies. If they don't have shareholders, they don't make money. They won't sell you insurance. Why would you? Um, and they invest in R and D. And for every drug that they develop, I've seen a hell of a lot of go go down. That they get to a phase one, two, three clinical trial. They have to wipe it because they've found a side effect. But we call them the bad guys. But people who prescribe compounding therapy and these people who do online um, advertising and tell you by identical safe, what evidence is there suddenly the good guys? What well, they're doing it because they're really nice and they're not making money. No, they have their own sales funnels. They are making money and they're not better than anyone else. We all go to work to earn money. I earn money as a doctor. I, you know, I do what I believe is right and I have my own ethics. And maybe, you know, there are pe very many people in pharmaceutical industry who are highly ethical. And there are many people who may be prescribing ho compounding hormones because they believe they're right. Do they know the data? Probably not. But, um, there are many people there making money too. So compounding therapy, that, is that the better? I've been saying bioidentical. It's compounding. But, but compounding therapy is kind of what we're talking about. That doesn't about make them better people. You know, they're, they're providing a product that people want to buy. They're not bad people necessarily, but, but sometimes it does play on the mythology 
of this is safer, this is better for you. But has that has has that been tested? No. Are there trials that have tested compounding therapies? No, uh, there's no, there are no studies that even show what dose you should be giving. There's no studies. There are one or two very poor quality publications that have reported on, say, East, um, compounded hormones and what blood levels they saw with their particular compound hormone. I can report one or two studies. So the trust in compounding therapy then appears to me to be off the back of distrust of yes. these big pharmaceutical companies, not so much that there is better data on There's on no safety. evidence it's more effective, safer, or even that what dose you are applying is a safe dose. And this becomes very important for a woman with a uterus who's taking estrogen and using progestogen, progesterone as a cream or a troche or a gel. What is the evidence that protecting the lining of her uterus relative to the amount of estrogen that's being taken? There is no data. Buyer beware. And I believe that there should be legislation that anything compounded people, not just HRT, people should be told, buyer beware, you do need to understand that this is not a TGA approved therapy. You are getting it as an individually compounded therapy. There is no evidence of the effectiveness of safety and there should be a patient safety leaflet in there. This, what Every TGA product has to have a patient safety leaflet. These you just get handed to. So if you have a regular bleeding or if you get sore breasts or whatever, or migraine, there's no safety leaflet of what you should do. I suspect some of this, I mean, I'm, I'm going to project onto uh, a sort of theoretical individual here, but um, I, I suspect some people who are opting for compounding therapy have heard about the breast cancer risk. For example, you mentioned that earlier, there's some stigma associated with taking these, uh, the hormone replacement um, interventions that are available and may just be thinking that they're doing the best thing that, well, this is an option that there, there isn't studies showing there's a risk of breast cancer. Yeah, just because there isn't a study doesn't mean there's no risk. And there is a big movement presently, including me prescribing, that the observational evidence, so looking at a whole lot of people and what they've done in very large databases, particularly from the UK general practice database, that women who take estrogen with progesterone or estrogen with a similar compound digesterone, uh, um, that, that this does not give the same breast cancer risk that has been reported for other estrogen progestin co combinations. And this has been seen in several large observational studies. That is very exciting, reassuring, positive, but that has never been shown in a randomized control trial. And without such a randomized control trial where women don't choose what they take, but they're randomly allocated to take, without that data, I can't say with my hand on my heart to a patient, this is definitely safer than any other formulation. So we are telling patients this, but I think we have to be very careful and be truthful with patients. Say, we believe this to be safer. Can I guarantee this is safer? No, I can't. Do you think the avoidance of HRT, that there must be avoidance? I'm sure people have looked at this across populations over the last couple of decades yeah. following WHI. Do you think avoidance of HRT has sort of demonstrably majorly affected women's health in, in Australia? I think avoidance of HRT over the last 20 years has definitely affected women's health. We are seeing earlier osteoporosis. We're seeing women who have gone through the menopause and it's been hell. They've been to hell and back. Um, I have finally seen women who've said, come to me and said, I just have been battling for several years. I can't do it anymore. And either they've seen several doctors who have refused to prescribe or they've been scared to take it. So there's the personal toll on their experience of life. 
and those around them, immediate friends, family, possibly work. There has been the impact on their long-term health. So, and particularly um, bone loss. And I've seen women in their late 50s, early 60s, having vertebral fractures. I've seen women with early menopause terrified to take HRT, even told by doctors not to take HRT, so they get into their 50s with osteoporosis, like you can't believe, and even fractures. And then it's, it's almost criminal. And the long-term effects in terms of health, we, we can't be certain yet, but also effects on vaginal dryness, sexual function, and relationships. Mm -hmm. So it's been horrible. For a woman who has a history of breast cancer and is contraindicated, what are her options? I, I read something about Q122. So right now, for a woman with, who has had breast cancer um, in whom we would prefer not to prescribe HRT unless our backs were against the wall and she was very badly off, we sometimes use some of the antidepressants at low dose do actually reduce hot flushes and night sweats and will re reduce anxiety. Um, there's a particular compound called gabapentin that can give some people relief, but some people it makes sleepy. And in some women, there's no benefit, they don't work. Um, quite often we're using um, a medication that's used to treat irritable bladder called oxybutynin that seems to hold promise and benefit some women. Have, in fact, we had a patient today in our clinic who's done really well. Her hot flushes are diminished markedly and she can now sleep because of oxybutynin. It's off-label, but it works. And there's no major safety concern. Um, we have published a paper of a compound Q122 that we found that women after breast cancer taking breast cancer therapy, aromatase inhibitors, and automoxifen significantly reduced hot flushes and night sweats, and the company is progressing with developing that. Does that have to be taken within a particular time of undergoing the, the cancer treatment? No, no, but it's it's in development. Right. And the compounds, NK3B inhibitors, will is a whole class of compounds. Um, Fesalinient is one particular that is likely to be approved in the US in the next few months for hot flushes and night sweats as an alternative to estrogen. Now these don't get rid of mood changes, anxiety, weight gain, they don't protect against bone loss. These are all specific to hot flushes and night sweats. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I, you know, I imagine a lot of uh, women who have gone through breast cancer treatment and taken tamoxifen or other drugs that lower estrogen uh, are concerned about things like osteoporosis, for example, and are maybe disappointed that they can't take HRT. Oh, absolutely. And I'll just say that the new one that's about to be approved in the US, I suspect it will be approved, Fesalinient, has not been studied in women after breast cancer. So the one unique difference between the Q122 is that, as you remember, I said tamoxifen blocks estrogen action, Q122 still worked in that setting. We don't know that Fesalinian will work in the setting of women taking something that blocks estrogen action. It may well do, but that study's yet to be done. It's great that there's interest in research happening in this area. Uh, you know, I, I think from speaking to people, there have been some frustrations about perhaps lack of funding for something that affects so many women. Is that, is that something that you've felt? Are we seeing now more funding and more research? There is more funding. I mean, we've been very fortunate to um, be funded by the NHMRC, the Heart Foundation to do studies of testosterone and heart disease in women, studies which we're recruiting to, bit of an ad there, um, and menopausal studies. So yes, there's, there's more funding now, but you know what, funding is, medical research funding's tight. So we're competing for the pot for cancer, men's health, cardiovascular disease, stroke, neurological conditions. I mean, the need, money needs to be spent in research. I, could I argue that we, you know, we should be diverting it all away from blood disorders and blood cancers to menopause? No, but we need quality research. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, I, I think you and I were actually connected. I won't name her, but a, a, a mutual uh, or friend of mine that I, I think maybe is involved in one of your studies or yes. um, spoke very highly of you and, and graciously introduced us. So um, sort of coming full circle there. We, we spoke earlier about testosterone. I'm conscious here. We've spoken a lot about the estrogen and progesterone. Um, I want to ask you a few questions about testosterone. Is there anything that you wanted to kind of add to to uh, the estrogen progesterone conversation that we didn't cover there? No, I think we've covered it. And I think the important message is that HRT is highly effective, MHT, what do you want to call it? A lot of the safety concerns have been oversold. Women shouldn't feel ashamed about talking about it. Women shouldn't feel ashamed about talking about their menopause. And everyone talks about everything else about their health. Talk about your menopause. And you'd probably be surprised everyone's happy to doesn't mind you talking about it and go and talk to your doctor and there are lots of alternatives mm -hmm. testosterone yeah sexual desire uh, low libido i think i watched a video of you talking about it or i read i read perhaps one of the papers you sent over um, that was suggesting this is an indication for testosterone replacement so let's go through that um, when is testosterone indicated for a woman who um, has reached menopause, is post-menopause, how would a woman know if they are that candidate and um, sort of commencing um, treatment, how long would it take to, to experience some changes? Okay, so every woman makes testosterone. The ovaries make testosterone. Estrogen's made from testosterone, so it's a female hormone. We have shown that testosterone levels in women decline about 25% during the reproductive years. So between the ages of 18 and 40, testosterone levels fall about 25% and do not change with natural menopause. Really important. Testosterone drops quite a lot. Then it just goes on a drip feeding, slow decline after the age of about 45 and doesn't change at natural menopause. So if a woman has low libido at menopause it's probably been there before um, then it stays it progressively just inches down until the early 60s and very strangely it starts to increase and libido increases we don't know not many people have done studies <laughs> it's an interesting in, study <laughs> in well we've done We've done studies, but libido is more complicated than that. Mm. Well, is, is testosterone, you mentioned there, so is testosterone, it's not the only hormone involved in libido, but is it the main one? Yeah, so, so it goes down, doesn't change at menopause, gets slow in the 60s and then starts to creep up again. That's how it works in the body. When we've looked at young women, we have done really big studies of young women and sexual function. We've looked at desire, arousal, orgasm, pleasure, sexual identity, responsiveness, etc. But in these studies, we don't just measure hormones, we measure their partner status, their mood and well-being, whether they're employed or not, whether they've got children, whether they're pregnant, whether they're breastfeeding, everything. So you, you can't just look at testosterone in isolation. And in young women, testosterone was associated with orgasm okay it was not associated with sexual desire or arousal when you took all those other things into consideration but the majority it, it explained less than one percent of the difference between women so in young women even though they've got more testosterone most of what's determining their sexual function is whether they're partnered whether they're depressed whether they're pregnant whether they're happy with their job what their sexual self-image is, it's got nothing to do with their testosterone. And so testosterone is oversold as important. It's important, has a role, but not major. Similarly, in postmenopausal women, it has a role, but if you try, when we've done studies, is testosterone directly proportional to sexual function? No, it's not. It has never been shown to be in older women. So all these other factors matter. So does your blood level of testosterone say anything about your sexual function? No, don't measure it, not worthwhile. 
Then the second thing is, if you give testosterone to a woman who presents with low sexual desire, does it make a difference? The jury's out in the studies of younger women. We've done two studies of women aged 35 to 45 with low libido, who are not depressed, and we did show small benefit. But the studies are small, and the general view is it's, those studies are insufficient to recommend it. Of studies of women who are postmenopausal, there is consistent evidence, over, overriding consistent irrefutable evidence that for women who are postmenopausal with low libido that is causing them concern, whose other factors have been generally addressed, who low libido is not because they're in a horrible relationship, that testosterone overall tends to improve sexual well-being. Not necessarily to back to what you would like it to be, but significantly improves sexual desire, arousal, orgasm, satisfaction and pleasure. And what's the format? How's that delivered and sort of typical dose? So it's given transdermally because when testosterone is taken orally, it can affect liver metabolism and cholesterol levels and cause weight gain. So even when we replace testosterone in men, we don't give it as a tablet, we give it as a patch or a gel, occasionally as an implant. You have to be careful because the dose can get too high. So through the skin, in Australia, I'm not, I can't say this without seemingly advertising a product, but we are fortunate we have a TGA regulated product for women in Australia, the only country in the world to have a product for women for testosterone replacement. So in other countries, they would not be prescribed or they'd be given a a male uh, testosterone, male version? So this is where it gets messy because in other countries without an approved version, some doctors are accessing the Australian formulation legally for their patients. How do they do that? They they ship it from here. They ship it from Australia, but... Some countries allow that, other countries don't. Um, For those that either don't know about that option or that it's not legal in the country to import a product, they are using either compounded testosterone or or little doses of male formulations, usually a tenth the dose of a male formulation. And the International Expert Committee agreed that it was safer to use an approved male formulation where you knew that If it says it contains X milligrams, it contains X milligrams. And the study has shown that that penetrates the skin Mm -hmm. rather than a compounded amount where you don't know the dose is the best guess. Does it even get through the skin? How much gets through the skin? It does too much get through the skin. That's interesting because I always assumed, and again, here, here I am being very naive, that if you walk into a pharmacy and get something compounded... Well, what's what's inside is what it says on the label. Well, probably it might be close, and I'm not going to have a go at compounding pharmacies because compounding chemists do a lot of good. I mean, a lot of dermatological conditions, for example, are treated by compounding medications. But when you're talking about, If I've got a ration, I'm going to put it on. I've got eczema and I use tar. I'm using the tar to treat what's on the top of my skin. If I'm giving it a compound to... And the compounding pharmacy is only doing what the doctor's prescribed. So they're not prescribing it. They're just doing what they've been asked to do. But if I'm prescribing something to get through the skin, how do I know that in this patient... One milligram of testosterone doesn't cause a low blood level, and then that patient, of course, is a high blood level. How much gets through the skin? Does it vary between patients? Where should you apply it? To your arm or your thigh? The side of application, the area of application, even changes how much you absorb. So that's why pharmaceutical companies spend millions working out how to give a drug. It's not, it's not just, it's not hit the wall, see what, you know, throw it at the wall and see what sticks. It's like millions trying to work out what is the best and safest way and most consistent way that if you give multiple people a particular dose, this is what's going to happen. So if a woman's contemplating testosterone therapy for sexual desire purposes, they may also think about, well, 
what could the possible side effects of testosterone be and you know, acne, body hair comes to mind, maybe cardiovascular disease. Is that something that's been quantified? Yeah. So if you're contemplating testosterone therapy, firstly, really think about what is affecting your sex life. No one else can get into your bedroom or your relationship. And you really need to have a very cold hearted view of what's happening in your life because i see do see women who are hoping if their sex is if they're more interested in sex it will fix a lot of other things and don't, don't even realize that just stress is affecting them or poor sleep or vaginal dryness um so you need to think about that but then um women if they if you take a dose use a dose of testosterone through the skin that is appropriately formulated and shown to get into the system, the side effects you see are only related to using too much. And those side effects, the first side effects are um, oily skin, acne, hair growth, and and if you really use too much scalp hair loss. And it's a, it's a consequence of overtreatment, not of appropriate therapy. And some women will be more vulnerable to overtreatment and others more resilient to it according to their own biology. Mm. Is there anything from the guidelines that kind of leaps out of out of you that we've missed? For the testosterone guidelines? Just in general for, for menopause, the, the sort of broad clinical guidelines for best practice. All the guidelines recommend against compounded therapy. They also consistently warn about um, non-evidence-based therapies where you don't even know necessarily what's in the product. Um, whether if it's effective, if it's ineffective but safe, probably doesn't matter. So taking, I don't know, vitamins, a low dose of vitamin E for menopausal symptoms it doesn't work. Is it going to hurt you? Probably not. If it's low dose, it can do harm if it's high dose. Um, but some of these things, you know, women say, I actually don't know what's in it. I've, I've been given this by the naturopath. I don't and I'm like, if I gave you something, you'd ask me what's in it and what are the side effects. So consistently know what you're taking. In fact, across the board, know what you're taking, understand what you're taking, understand what is the evidence for what you're taking? What are the known risks for what you're taking? Where did it come from? So I think that's consistent in the guidelines. The guidelines consistently warn against taking hormone replacement therapy to treat symptoms that may have nothing to do with menopause or to prevent chronic disease. Although HRT does reduce improved cholesterol profiles generally, it shouldn't be used to prevent heart disease. The best way to prevent heart disease is treat hypertension, cholesterol, smoking, body weight, etc. And what further research are you doing at Monash? I didn't mention, by the way. I, so I did my undergrad. Here's a fun fact for people. I haven't haven't uh, told too many people this. So I did my undergrad at La Trobe University. I did physiotherapy out there in Bundura, and. I actually, between first and second year, I left and had applied it to Monash to do law science. <laughs> and I lasted about a month there. I love the science aspect. Uh, there was a lot of reading on the, on the law side of things. And at that stage, I was very good at looking at pictures and anatomy and whatnot. And I begged the, the, uh, the, the guys back at La Trobe to take me back. So I finished physiotherapy over there. And, um, but I did spend a month at Monash. Um, but yeah, at, at, at Monash or um, internationally, what, what studies are currently being conducted? What are the open questions that you have in, you, in your mind that you, you would really like to explore? So my group, particularly presently, um, is we're doing studies looking at in, we're recruiting to Monash University in Melbourne. We're based at the Alfred Hospital, not out of Clayton, which will mean nothing to people not from Melbourne. Um, but we're recruiting studies to look at whether testosterone has benefits. So we're recruiting women who've gone through menopause and are aged under 55 years, 
who are taking estrogen therapy, but where the testosterone has a diff additional benefit in protecting against bone loss and muscle strength. So um, that's looking at, is there any benefit for the younger postmenopausal women, woman under 55 of adding in testosterone over estrogen for their bones? Then the other big question that we're really interested in is the effects of testosterone on muscle. Muscle's incredibly important because it keeps you upright, it's your locomotion, it protects you against diabetes. As women get older, they start to lose muscle and their muscle gets infiltrated by fat and then increases the risk of metabolic disease and diabetes and weakness and falling over and fracture. So we are recruiting women to studies, women over the age of 55, not on hormone therapy, to see if testosterone will protect against muscle loss. And it's very cool because we're using new technology to do these studies. The old fashioned way is, you know, a hand grip or how many times you can sit and stand in a, in a minute, the sit to stand test. We've got German technology, which is a, a mat where if women jump in the air and land, we can actually measure the force by which they land, corrected for their body weight, and even time off the mat, how high they jump, so we can get really sensitive changes in muscle power with these mats, even tapping your foot on the mat. So we've got new technology to do these studies. But presently, the jury is out where the testosterone benefits against muscle loss. And the other area we're looking at is testosterone and heart disease, because Counterintuitively, we have published this, this last year that older women with low testosterone are more likely to have a heart attack or a stroke. You wouldn't expect that, but that's what we found. So when women gain weight, get diabetes, get hypertension, their heart muscle stiffens and they start to get change in their heart muscle function. And women don't get symptoms, but if you do a cardiac ultrasound, you can see these changes. So we're interested in when we're, whether testosterone stops these changes progressing or reverses them. So we're recruiting women with the Baker Institute in Melbourne who are over, over 55 years to see if whether testosterone protects their heart muscle. These are placebo controlled Everything trials. we do is double blind placebo controlled trials. Women have a 50% chance they'll get dummy therapy that's really important because we've got to compare active right. to dummy therapy. Mm -hmm. But the heart muscle stuff is very interesting because this cardiac change of women with diabetes and overweight and hypertension is increasing in the community. It's becoming the leading cause of heart failure. And we're trying to get in early to see if these changes can be prevented. So why testosterone why has that become the focus for you with your research is that just because we've had decades of research already on on estrogen had testosterone sort of been ignored for a while and now we're realizing it has a, a greater sort of role in in women's health well we know estrogen prevents bone loss but it doesn't always completely prevent bone loss so we're asking the question in the first study of women under 55 is this a missing link Mm. And we know that for women who go through early menopause, estrogen often isn't enough. And so what happens is often women in that situation, people just give them more estrogen. Well, maybe we should just give them some testosterone that can be converted to estrogen in bone. So that's the story there. We know testosterone is what we call anabolic. In it, I mean, people for years have abused testosterone and synthetic testosterone in weightlifting and bodybuilding and stuff. So we know if you take masses of testosterone, it might do something for your muscle. But what if hap what happens if you just replace it? Does it protect women after the age of 55 against muscle loss? And does it even increase their muscle and protect them metabolically? So we're asking these questions because these are unanswered questions. And if we find benefit, these could be game changers because we're an aging population and muscle loss, as I said, causes diabetes and falls and fracture. Yeah, we need all the help we can get. Yeah, It's almost counterintuitive because I, I think a lot of people will see testosterone, like you said, as a bodybuilding drug. And I guess this is a, a, a clear example of the dose. Dose. Matters. All about dose. Right. 
let's finish this with something positive. Yeah. Uh, what are the beautiful aspects of reaching menopause and post-menopause? You know, I think society probably places a lot of value on women of reproduction, reproductive age. Um, why are, are women who have reached menopause and, and post-menopause, why are they valuable, important members of our society and, and why should they feel that way? So one of my colleagues always uses the term social capital and particularly midlife women contribute such an enormous amount to social capital. Many midlife women have still got kids at home going through their early, mid, late, later teen years, early adulthood, and they've got so much to contribute to their families in that way. Um, they've got knowledge in the workplace and experience, and even if women are going back into the workplace, they still bring life experience. I think women at midlife can offer so much in terms of just mentoring younger women. and. So you've got a woman back in the workplace and she feels a bit fragile because she's not with the, up with the IT and all the younger, younger people know it, know their IT. Okay, you don't have the IT skills, but you've got life skills and you can actually help those younger people in their, you can be a sounding board for their career decisions and just getting through their lives and their day. You have so much to offer people. Um, you've had all the experience of trying to have kids and maybe not working or what working, or working in the decisions you've made. Um, unpaid capital of volunteers, unpaid capital of caring for older people. And just, as I said, life knowledge. The old saying, can't put a head on, old head on young shoulders, but you can contribute so much. They contribute care, thoughtfulness. You can contribute patience. You can just contribute love. I, I, I think midlife and older women have so much to offer and we should value and respect midlife and older women. Beautifully said, Susan. You're powerful. This is powerful stuff. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on and, and sharing this. And um, I hope you realize all the important work you're doing. I'm sure the Australian Order uh, hopefully gave you a moment to reflect on that. But um, this has been incredible. I know that the listeners will be just as grateful uh, to you and your work uh, as I am and, and coming on and sharing all of the information that you have and your wisdom. So um, thank you for that. And when those studies are, are out and published, uh, please come back. Let's do this again. Thank you for listening. <laughs> thank you for joining me for this episode and your interest in science-based conversation. I hope you enjoyed it and found the information covered interesting and instructive. If you did and you'd like to show your support for the show, please subscribe to our YouTube channel where you can stay up to date with new episodes and watch them in video format. Please also consider subscribing to the show on the Spotify and or Apple podcast app, wherever you enjoy listening to podcasts. You can also leave a comment on the YouTube videos or a review on Apple or Spotify. Again, a great way to support the show and make our content more discoverable for others to enjoy and learn from. If you have any comments about the episodes, suggestions for future episodes, including guests you'd like to see on the show, please leave those in the comments section on YouTube. I myself and my team will take notes of these comments when planning for future episodes. Finally, the best way to support the show and receive discounts on products we love is by checking out our sponsors at theproof.com forward slash friends. That's theproof.com forward slash friends. Enjoy your week, stay well, and I look forward to catching you in the next episode.